Hello PSI 2000 students, uh, back for week five, uh, the topic of which is the um, is Canadian federalism, central governance, the provinces, and Quebec national identity. Um, we recall that in this theme of the course, we're dealing with major structural factors in, in Canadian political life, and we started off with the Constitution, which is the highest law of the land, of course. But now we're looking at Canadian federalism, which um, is very much a reflection of or, or has resulted in the regional and ethnic uh, politics that we referred to in the first theme of the course. Um, but Canadian federalism being such a core aspect of, of Canadian political life is obviously a major topic of, of Canadian politics across the board. I joke to you about the airport shells that uh, when it comes to Canadian politics are full of books on federalism, which is in fact <laughs> has been the truth in the past. I'm not sure it's uh, the truth today, but it certainly has been in the past. Um, today and uh, this week, therefore, I want to concentrate a lot more on federalism and the institutions of federalism and how our federalist uh, system has evolved. Um, of course, <clears throat> you know that the federal, uh, we discussed the Constitution of uh, B&A Act of 1867 and what preceded that and what immediately followed that was largely about defining the, the constitutional powers of uh, the powers of governance uh, between the federal and provincial governments. And um, that, uh, that has persisted throughout uh, Canada's history. Um, at the at the start of Confederation, of course, the founding fathers of Canadian Confederation envisaged uh, a, a very strong central government. But as things evolved uh, over time, the Privy Council of, uh, of of Great Britain and also the Canadian uh, Supreme Court have defined and redefined those powers such that uh, actually the Canadian Federalist mosaic now is is one of, yes, the federal government has strong powers, but the provinces are also strong in their own right uh, due to the, uh, the interpretation of the Constitution over time. Uh, those powers have become enshrined through court decisions and through conventions. And so now we have a very um, <clears throat> strong set of governments, both federally and provincially, that have their own uh, domains within which they can operate. But uh, uniquely, uh, we also have domains that were never well defined by the Constitution that then become areas of uh, tension between governments. For example, the division of power with respect to managing the environment was never clearly set out in the BNA Act and hasn't been clearly set out since except for uh, through um, court decisions and conventions. Um, both federal and provincial governments have roles in protection of the environment, for example. And there are many other areas where, the, where that is the case, um, where uh, constitutional powers have actually been uh, sorted out through a trial and error, through court decision and convention over time, rather than being clearly articulated within any constitutional law um, in, in writing sp explicitly. So um, a lot of what federalism has emerged has been through this process of, of, of decision, trial, error, uh, political uh, dispute, resolution, negotiation, and so on over time. Um, and we certainly see that in, in certain care, core areas like the environment, for example. Um, and also the use of the federal spending power, where the federal government has a authority to spend anywhere in the country and can use that spending power to uh, encourage provinces to move in a certain direction or even to curtail, curtail provincial power. Um, uh, so there's there's a lot of politics that goes on in, in federalism that way. And our federal politics has also been closely aligned with uh, the issue of um, Quebec and Quebec national identity and the ability of Quebec governments over time to enhance their powers in the name of protecting French identity or the French fact in Canada. But the minute that one provincial government opens up those additional powers, uh, of course, other provincial governments are going to run through that open door as quickly as they can, obviously. So there's also been that dynamic of how Quebec governments have managed to uh, wedge additional powers over time, but other provinces have enjoyed uh, similar uh, in increases in their, their scope of influence and their scope of power. Um, <clears throat> there are different ways of understanding how federalism has developed in Canada. I mean, you'll see in my notes for the week that there's the contract theory and the compact theory. 
of Canadian federalism. The compact theory holds that it was a negotiation between the two founding cultures, French and English, and that constituted federalism. But the contract theory uh, argues that really uh, the creation of the federal government was a contract, whereas the pro provinces agreed to give up certain of their powers to the federal government in order to constitute a, a, a country in common. Um, these are idealized uh, theories, but each of them speaks to a certain element of Canadian uh, federalism uh, over time. Um, the Judicial uh, Committee of the Privy Council of the Great Britain and the Supreme Court of Canada have had a significant role in, in, in basically transforming what was the most historians would agree was the original tent, intent of the Founding Fathers to have a strong central government. Uh, but the uh, but that has changed through various decisions over time, and the uh, theories about why that occurred was that that Britain, given all of its other challenges at the time in the pre and po immediate post eighteen sixty seven period, uh, didn't want conflict or didn't want civil war or any other disputes to occur in Canada because of all the other challenges they had. So when there were regional protests or regional complaints or so on and so forth the the um, the uh, basically the judicial committee um, decided that the best solution was to appease as many of those uh, requests as possible without uh, without dismantling Canada as a as a member of the Commonwealth. So there were those tendencies, but over time those gather momentum. But now we have a situation where the federalist powers have largely stabilized between federal and provincial government, but there, there's always going to be that, uh, that dynamic uh, tension over time. So um, <clears throat> it's important when you read through uh, federalism, you also understand that around federalism is not just constitutional uh, authorities and, 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 uh, and, and a division of powers, but um, it's also a whole set of federal institutions have built up around uh, Canadian federalism. Uh, you know, for everything from working relationships at the bureaucratic level to committees, intergovernmental inter, uh, committees that are set up at the working level, all the way to ministerial uh, intergovernmental committees like the Canadian Council of Ministers of the Environment and, and things like that. So there's a whole system that is built up around uh, the running of the federal system as well. And uh, so those all begin to shape the dynamic of what Canada's political landscape is. Um, and so everything from the division of powers from 1867 all the way through the decisions of the various uh, legal courts on division of powers to, uh, to the current day, um, there have been uh, expressions of those, uh, those fed that federalist character in the institutions that have formed up around government in Canada. Then they're a major, they're a major factor of Canada's uh, political landscape. So uh, read through the material and make sure you understand the division of powers, uh, where there were gaps in the division of powers and how that has contributed to Canadian politics, like in the area of the environment. Um, but also in the establishment of various federal institutions that have that that allow the the federalist form of government to function smoothly most of what canadians don't even see but obviously the federal governments and the provincial governments have ongoing uh, working relationships and contacts virtually every day by the hundreds uh, at all different levels of the of the political system and the bureaucratic system and that defines a lot of what Canadian politics is, as different from, say, a unitary state like England, for example, or, or where there's, uh, you know, one national government and the, the, the junior governments are all uh, basically extensions of that. It's much the way uh, in the provinces, uh, the, the provincial governments constitute our municipal governments. The municipal governments are, 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 are not independent entities. They are entities of the provincial government uh, in law. In practice, of course, uh, it's it's much it's much different than that. But in 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 law, uh, the municipal governments are creations of the provincial governments. But the provincial governments are not creations of the federal government because they enjoy their own uh, independent constitutional powers. Um, and this has required certain institutions to evolve within Canada that help us manage those uh, those levels of government and relationships between them. 
So um, uh, to make sure you under you have that understanding of the Canadian federal system, and that it's more than just law. It's it's a series of working relationships between levels of government, and how that plays out uh, in on on a regular basis. And we're seeing that now in Canadian politics, where uh, <clears throat> the new Liberal government has come in saying that you know we have to get the economy going again, we have to spend money, we have to do things that stimulate the economy. Well, immediately then, uh, that's not just the federal government going out and spending a bunch of money in the jurisdiction of the provinces. No, it's an elaborate system that then has to kick into gear where the provinces, you know, have requests, the municipalities have requests, they negotiate with the federal government on what's going to get funded, what isn't going to get funded. The federal government has the money, it has its priorities, but it can't just steam into the uh, jurisdiction of the uh, the other levels of government and do things. It has to work through the federalist uh, system the federal system to come to uh, to acceptable solutions it doesn't mean everybody's going to agree all the time but it's it wouldn't be sustainable if um, if the governments didn't agree most of the time uh, and that's the nature of a federal system so uh, go through the readings and uh, stay focused on how you can see that uh, business, for example, uh, must deal with the federal system as well. It's not just governments dealing with the federal system. It's individuals having to deal with the federal system, and it's businesses having to deal with the federal system. Some things they have to go to the provincial government. Some things they're involved with the federal government. Sometimes they're involved with both. Sometimes they're caught in a dispute between the two. Um, it's, it's a key dynamic of Canadian politics, and it has to be understood clearly. Okay, so we'll talk to you again next week. Have a good week and talk to you soon.